Hello, my name is Ben Johnson. I am the professor of evangelism and church growth at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. It's my privilege today to present to you Walter Brueggemann. Walter is the McFeeders Professor of Old Testament here at Columbia Seminary. He is the author of numerous books and articles, including significant commentaries on both Genesis and Exodus. Perhaps Professor Brueggemann is best known for his emphasis on the prophetic imagination and faith in a postmodern age. In this series, Professor Brueggemann brings his great knowledge and his enormous skills of interpretation and communication to the tasks of evangelism. In this series of lectures, Professor Brueggemann will address evangelism in three unfinished scenes. Outsiders become insiders, forgetters make rememberers, and beloved children become beliefful adults. It is with a great sense of privilege that I present to you Walter Brueggemann. Now, uh, what I uh, want to do in these three lectures is to talk about evangelism for three constituencies, and uh, today I want to talk about the most obvious of these, and that is evangelizing the outsider. If you have your program in front of you, I switched the titles, but that doesn't make any difference. I'm talking about the people who have no membership in Israel's narrative world. Am I talking too loudly, loudly enough? All right, if it gets one way or the other, you tell me. There was a church leader that got up to speak, and before she spoke, she said there's something wrong with his microphone. And the congregation responded, and also with you. <laughs> the text that I'm going to talk about is in Joshua 24. If you do not have a Bible, I suggest you check into a motel and take one. <laughs> As you know, there are parts of the Old Testament and parts of the book of Joshua that command Israel to destroy the Canaanites. That makes evangelism very difficult. But scholars have noticed that in the central hill country around the city of Shechem, there was nowhere in the Old Testament any conquest, no armed confrontation with the Canaanites, but peaceful coexistence with the Canaanites. Now let me talk about the word Canaanite. It is not an ethnic term. It does not refer to an ethnic or tribal group of people. Most scholars now think that the word Canaanite is simply a generic word for all the people who live in the land, and the Israelites are Canaanites of a certain ilk. The word Canaanite is used in the Old Testament usually polemically. It refers, get this, it refers to people who are committed to exploitative, non-covenantal social relationships, that is, injustice, and who practiced forms of religion, Canaanite religion, which gave legitimization to exploitative social practices. You don't have to translate that much, do you? So I'm going to use the term Canaanite as a biblical reference to those who practice anti-neighbor life. They tend to be the urban elites in the ancient world who keep seizing stuff from the food-producing peasants. <laughs> 
for their own comfort and advantage. Now this understanding of Canaanite gives us a model for evangelism of outsiders. The work of evangelism is to help these outsiders, Canaanites, who are trapped in anti-neighbor practices and who practice religion that justifies it, to give up their Canaanite practices of exploitative greed through tax and credit laws and the free market system and to join Israel's covenantal narrative which will be expressed in neighbor practice. So the question of evangelizing the outsider comes down to this. How can a person who lives in a different way, legitimated by a different ideology, be made a full participant in the story and the life of Israel? How can they join? The answer that I want to propose is in Joshua 24. In this text, we are invited to a meeting at Shechem where Joshua authorizes folk to make a decision either to live life in covenantal ways with the God of the covenant or to live a different kind of life that is legitimated by other gods who are very different from Yahweh. It is this choice that permits outsiders to become insiders. As insiders are shaped by a different story, the neighbor is differently perceived and a different God becomes the shaper of reality. I consider, as the way I've set this up, to talk about three sample outsiders who entertain Israel's three classic memories and who thereby embrace a new life. The three are a young woman who comes from a dysfunctional family, a tired business executive that's got 12 years to retirement, and a member of the permanent underclass. These are all candidates to become transformed insiders. Not much is known about the meeting at Shechem. It's known that there were peaceful coexistence. It's known that the dominant voice at Shechem was that of Joshua. Now I want to tell you four things about Joshua. First, his name means save, Yasha, as in, you shall call his name Yahshua, because he Yasha his people. He is Jesus, or Jesus, before the New Testament. Second, Joshua was not an eyewitness to the great saving events of the Pentateuch to which he bears witness. He is a generation removed. He is a child of the tradition who has learned to trust the story. And this meeting is in part an ongoing traditioning process. Third, Joshua is a person utterly pledged to Torah obedience because he believes that Torah obedience will secure the land and make a good life possible. His speech in this chapter is an offer of Torah obedience to those who gather in Shechem. And fourth, Joshua's authority is grounded in his great courage when he and Caleb were the only ones who were willing to trust God against great odds to do something dangerous, according to the will of God. Now, scholars believe that this chapter is pivotally situated in the final form of the biblical text. It stands at the culmination of the Hexateuch, that is the first six books. Joshua 21, 43 to 45, it is asserted that all of God's promises have now been kept. And then in chapter 24, 
Joshua invites the outsiders at Shechem to become insiders to this story through which all the promises will continue to be kept. We do not know who all was in the assemblage with Joshua that day in Shechem. It is reported in the first verse that all the tribes of Israel, that means the leaders, the heads, the judges, and the officers were there. In a like meeting in Deuteronomy 31, verse 21, it says that the people, men, women, and children, as well as aliens, came to the meeting. This was a large, inclusive, comprehensive meeting for Joshua believed that the offer of these alternative memories was urgent for all of the population, was available to all, and could be appropriated by all. But we can't pay attention to everyone at the meeting, and therefore I imagine these three specific listeners who came to the meeting, who listened to Joshua, listeners who could be contemporary with us, but who were probably not very different even those days. If you have your Bible in front of you, look at how he begins. Joshua says in verses 2 to 4, what he does, first of all, is to summarize the book of Genesis. Not long ago, your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led them through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave to him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Joshua takes a long sweep of the ancestors. He begins with Terah, who worshipped other gods, but he mentions Abraham, who journeyed, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and Esau. This is all familiar stuff. It may have been familiar to the people at Shechem who hadn't even heard of the Exodus because this was the home country of those ancestors. There are two recurring themes among these ancestors from the book of Genesis. On the one hand, Mother Sarah and Mother Rebecca and Mother Rachel were all barren. They couldn't get pregnant. They couldn't have a child. They had no future. And the way the story goes, generation after generation at the last moment in the fullness of time, God worked the impossible and gave an heir and created a future when none seemed available. It is, if we're not so familiar with it, a story to evoke astonishment. How come in our family that these babies are always born just before midnight. On the other hand, in every generation there is intense sibling rivalry over land and water. Still going on over there. Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, Joseph and his brothers. The quarrels are intense because they concern well-being into the future. That's what land disputes are always about. And in each generation, the younger, unentitled child gets the inheritance. This whole thing that Joshua summarizes is a tale of the first becoming last and the last becoming first. And the folk at Shechem heard this odd story on that day. There is a counter theme in the story to the tensions between the brothers and the sons and all of that, which Joshua mentions. There is a family sense. It's kind of amazing. When Abraham died, Ishmael and Isaac together buried him, even though they had not agreed. When Isaac died, Esau and Jacob buried him together. And when Jacob died, as you know, there is a moving scene of reconciliation. There is a family whose members do not cease to interact and do not cease 
to care for each other. So the impossible births and the impossible reconciliations evidence a very special family. Genesis tells the story of a deeply troubled family, but the trouble is matched by a healing purpose that addresses the family, gives hope, offers futures, and heals along the way. And the story, as Joshua tells it, is dominated by the word give. I gave him Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau, I gave Esau the hill country. This is a story about a gift and a giver. It is a story about a power that is at work to give newness, to break the vicious cycles of barrenness and alienation and hostility. One of the listeners that day at Shechem who heard this summary was a young woman. She lived in a troubled, dysfunctional family and in that family were endless wars and disputes over turf, unsettled accounts over old debts and resentments. And her family, like so many families, couldn't get past those wars. She rightly perceived her family's situation as helpless and hopeless and impossible and she saw that it was not only hopeless for her, but that it was an impossible destiny for her siblings and for generations to come under the third and fourth generation. And she lived in despair. Imagine what happened that day in Shechem. A helplessly troubled family. And this woman listens to the story of another family from Genesis also hopelessly troubled, but visited, intruded upon, made new, given an undeserved future. It is an alternative story, told and retold, very old, and now on the lips of Joshua, told at Shechem. And what happened to the young woman as she listened she began to host this story as a counter tale of her own life and her own family. And in her listening, it dawned on her that her family was not without the giver, not without the gift, not without the offer of newness. And what she heard that day from Joshua was a tale of a possibility whereby God breaks hopelessness, reconciles siblings, guarantees futures, and gives safe land. God does what this family or any family cannot do for itself. And as she listened, she found the weight of despair being lifted and she decided to refuse despair. Joshua moves quickly in verses 5 through 7. He moves to a second narrative about the Exodus. Then I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst, and afterward I brought you out, and when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt, and afterward you lived in the wilderness a long time. That's some story. We're too familiar with it. The account is dominated by first-person statements of Yahweh, who is the key player in the drama. And this Yahweh visited Israel through human agents, Moses and Aaron. And this same character, Yahweh, takes on the empire, the savage monopoly of power and authority. 
And as the story goes, in the chaotic waters, this invisible one, this utterly free and unpredictable one, takes on the empire with its arms and its horses and its chariots, and by any rational reckoning, the empire would prevail. But Yahweh is a wild card in the deck. And it turns out that the empire does not always prevail because there is a freakish freedom in the historical process that has not yet been domesticated. This holy power brought Israel to the edge of the chaotic waters, and there Israel watched in astonishment. This little community of the powerless was at great risk. It had learned, as little communities of the powerless always learn, even at Columbia Seminary, to conform silently to the empire and to get your degree and go. And now Israel broke the silence. Israel cried out, it announced itself and its hurt, and it made a large demand on the holy power of heaven. And the wonder of the narrative is that the cry from below evoked the power of God from above. In response to the slave cry, God moved the darkness and the sea. God mobilized the creation on behalf of the needy slaves. God managed the chaos redemptively, and they were freed as they never expected to be. Did you notice as I read it that Joshua can't quite make up his mind about how he wants to tell the story? He can't decide if the exodus happened to our ancestors, for he says, I brought your ancestors out, or whether it happened to us, because he said, you came to the sea. I brought your ancestors out, and you came to the sea. It's always them, and it's always us. Always then and always now. Always there and always here. And all of you people that are schooled in historical criticism got to get past it about how it could be them and us and there and here. It's very odd, this story that Joshua retells. Let me tell you something about this story that Presbyterians do not like. It is a class reading of historical reality. That is, it contrasts and set over against each other the haves and the have-nots. You can see why Presbyterians do not like that. The story is about the clash between a dominant empire and a docile slaves, and I believe that the church has not much to say about any good news until it does a class reading of social reality, an unwelcome class reading. The story tells of a miracle whereby the dominant empire has its authority broken and Yahweh emerges as a real and powerful character in this reality. So there are three players in this struggle, not two. Empire, peasants, Yahweh. And the world in which we ministered thinks there are only two. And evangelism is saying there are three. The other oddity in this narrative that doesn't fit with all this Calvinism about sovereignty is that the holy power of God is triggered by the cry of the peasants. The peasants act first, not the holy God. I didn't make this up. That's what it says in the text. <laughs> now, we don't know who all came to Shechem that day, but one of the people that was standing on the edge of the crowd was a tired business executive who worked in the brickyard. He was not an Egyptian, he was a peasant. But because he was conscientious and productive, he had become a foreman, foreman, trusted by the Egyptians, given power and authority as a middle management guy. He was trusted by the Egyptians, and therefore he was despised by his own people. The overriding reality of his life was the brick quota, day after day. He lived a good life because he ran a good brickyard. But he had noticed two realities in his life. First, he had noticed that paying his mortgage depended upon his continued enmeshment in the royal system. 
He could not let up for one minute or he would lose everything. He also noticed that each time he met the quota of bricks, they gave him a bigger quota. That is, he had to keep at production with ever-increasing intensity. He was trapped, and there was no way out. He was exhausted, and he no longer cared about his work, but he kept going through the motions. He thought often that he despised how his life had been caught, and he counted how he had 12 years and 13 days left until retirement. He knew exactly how many days. Sound like a school teacher. 12 years is a damn long time to put off your life. And every one of you got parishioners that are doing that. Indeed, 13 days is too much to put off your life. He had become a eunuch for the corporation. That not only means he had given his life over, it probably means he couldn't have an erection either. But he knew that he had to produce and conform. It's kind of like being a pastor, isn't it? Joshua's retelling of the Exodus narrative refuses to accept this despairing resignation. The narrative starts reality in another place. It views the empire not as a great provider, but as a deathly nemesis. It tells about this new character, Yahweh, who had not been known by the workers and not reckoned with by the empire, so that the whole narrative begins with the utterance of this, I... It is a new I that generates a community of pain and hope. And the truth of the matter is that the I of Yahweh only lives on the lips of the evangelists, nowhere else. Upon hearing this tale, our company robot notices this story defines docility and urges pain to be spoken and dares to break up the tea party of the empire and gives authority where there had been none. This wearied man noticed that the story is not simply a pious religious narrative, but it is about economic power and jobs and security and exploitation, and he noticed that the story is very dangerous and the summons from docility is uncompromisingly abrupt. But as he listened at the edge of the crowd, he received a fresh glimpse of his hopeless conformity. Joshua had uttered the phrase, I brought you out. The man had already known himself trapped with no way out. And now the words, I brought you out. I brought you out through human courage, through crisis, through risk, through holy mystery. And as a result, there is on the other side of the water now life untrapped. And the man began to ponder that he had been too docile and it was killing him. And maybe he would try otherwise. He would make the effort because now in the drama of his life, there is another one who sponsors a departure. A departure from docility into self-assertion is a dangerous move that a whole lot of people do not want to make. He also noticed that the story was honest because the last thing Joshua said was, afterward, you will live a long time in the wilderness. In the wilderness without fringe benefits or guarantees. But he thought it worth the risk. And he began to let into his life little gestures of departure that could eventually amount to a massive liberation. Joshua moves quickly to a third story, the narrative of the gift of the land, verses 8 to 13. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, the son of Peor, to curse you, but I wouldn't listen to Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you, so I rescued you out of the land. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I handed them all over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove you out before the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you the land on which you had not labored, towns which you had not built, and you lived in them. And you ate the fruit of vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. Now this is a story that Joshua knows something about because he did it. <laughs> 
He's now finished with the Moses story because Moses never saw these promises kept. Joshua got where Moses didn't. And so he tells about Yahweh's resolve to complete the story by giving the peasants their own land. And the land which they came to was not empty. It was already claimed. So there is at the center of Joshua's narrative a story of land dispute and conflict and aggression and violence, and it's a great embarrassment to us. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. But in this moment of crisis, the have-nots do not worry much about niceties in the midst of social conflict. They have to take what they can, and now that the God of Abraham and Sarah did not want them to live landless for another day, and therefore the land of Canaan became an arena for violent disruption, even as it is today. This story is not simply about human conflict, but it dares to claim that the holy God is allied with landless peasants who had to struggle all the day. The power to bless and curse that Joshua talks about is crucial. In war, propaganda is pivotal. And the capacity to denounce and condemn the enemy is powerful. And for that reason, this cunning king of Moab hires a propaganda officer. I think it's called an intelligence community now. Balaam is supposed to curse, but he can't curse because when he speaks, his words come out to be a blessing. It is as though God has jammed the airways and God forces Balaam to condemn the Moabite war effort and to support the intruders. At the center of this story is the God who violates conventions and gives these nobodies a fresh chance. And this is how that speech ends. I gave you land on which you had not labored. I gave you houses which you had not built. And you ate fruit of vineyards which you did not plant. You have not labored. You did not build. You did not plant. You get stuff that other people have built and planted. God lets you have their stuff because you are entitled to it. I don't think that'll preach. <laughs> At the very edge of the crowd was a member of the permanent underclass. He was unshaven and unkempt. Probably had a grocery cart with him. Wouldn't lift up his head. He could hardly remember how he had dropped out of the working middle class, but it was an irretrievable drop. He had listened to the market ideology long enough to believe its claim, and he believed that if you worked, you would prosper, and so now his lack of prosperity was his own fault. He did not blame the system. He had learned to blame himself. He was embarrassed. He was ashamed of his poverty. And he knew about his appearance, but he did not have any power to reverse the process. He understood his deprived, disadvantaged social position. And while he seethed in resentment, he knew how to keep his place. Then he heard Joshua talking insurrection. Land on which you did not labor, houses you did not build, vineyards you did not plant. No, it was not an insurrection. It was a gift, a promise, an offer. He knew the deathly ditch of disadvantage. And now he hears an offer of goods that he never thought he would receive. The story smacks of violence, but it is an act of hope. It is an utterance about the reversal of disadvantage, and it dawned he was entitled, meant by God, to have and to hold life for himself. When he left the meeting, as is always the case with this story, we don't know if it led him to violence. It might, or it might only generate hope 
and break the ideology of deprivation and stir the yearning for entitlement and begin to invite liberated assertion. So there was a hush at Shechem at the end of verse 13. There was an electricity released into the assemblage as there always is when these stories are rightly told. Israel lives in a three-storied universe. The young woman came from a hopeless family and the story she hears is the Genesis story about a family that kept receiving new possibilities. The middle-aged business executive could not satisfy the empire, and the story he hears is the story of the exodus and departure to freedom. And the homeless man is in deprivation, and the story he hears is the story of land and entitlement. Now, there were others at Shechem, but stay with these three who are typical outsiders who hear the story. The problem with outsiders is that they believe false stories. She believed a story of permanent dysfunction. And the executive believed a story of insatiable demand. And the street person believed a story of endless marginality. And now Joshua gathers this dangerous alternative memory and the story of family dysfunction is retold as possibility and the story of insatiable demand is retold as departure and the story of endless marginality is retold as entitlement. And they heard that day what they had never heard before or even dared to imagine. And the key character in all these stories is this holy one who wasn't present in their wrong stories. In Genesis, it is Yahweh who causes the impossibilities. In Exodus, it is Yahweh who authorizes departures. And in Joshua, it is Yahweh who gives houses and vineyards. Notice about this Yahweh. Hardly a credible character, only given as a character inside these Stories. The problem with systematic theology is that it wants to take the character out of the stories so he just sits there in isolation and he hadn't got any verbs. <laughs> this character in these stories is an intellectual impossibility and therefore an embarrassment. And what conservatives do is reduce this story to a creed that they can hammer on people. And what liberals do is to reduce this story to my experience, which simply isn't interesting. When you get a story without this character, you get a family story that says, our dysfunction is the way it must inevitably be. And you get an executive who believes that Pharaoh's brick quota is the end of the story. And you get a homeless guy who thought he was at fault for his disadvantage. Those stories, the stories that people carry around in their bodies from our culture when they come to church, are perfectly credible stories without God. And now Joshua invites to a more excellent way. And these three listeners were not worried about Joshua's intellectual embarrassment. 
They were persuaded by his narrative power to imagine themselves differently. And they discovered that in hearing this story about God who had never been narrated to them before, they were given a new story of self. And she became a woman open to possibility and the businessman became capable of departure and the street man was now entitled. That's how it works in these memories. That's how the whole gospel narrative is put together. The story of this God is an authorization for a different social practice in the world. And evangelism is not worth a damn unless it is an authorization for a different social practice in the world. All of life is reconstrued. Now after this recital of these three stories, Joshua comes to the hard part in verses 14 and 15. He says, now therefore, meaning so what? And he issues an imperative. An imperative in three parts. First, fear Yahweh. That means take Yahweh with ultimate seriousness. Second, serve Yahweh. Get with the new obedience. But what would such a choice entail? What it would entail choosing the story of Genesis against the conventions of dysfunction, choosing the story of Exodus against the conventions of entrapment, choosing the story of Joshua against the conventional story of deprivation. And third, put away the gods from beyond the river. Get rid of those other gods. In Joshua, I'm sorry, in Genesis 35, there is a closely related narrative that says that Jacob put away his foreign gods by digging a hole and burying them. A quite dramatic ritual event of bearing the tokens of destructive loyalties. I read about a therapeutic theory recently that has, uh, that the therapist writes letters to the person in therapy, giving them authorization, awarding them for their new life, and recognizing some dramatic, concrete act marking the transformation. This imperative in the New Testament shows up in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, which is a baptismal text. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self corrupt and deluded by its lust to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. What is to be gotten rid of is an old self an old identity, and I'll bet you an old narrative. That's what people go into counseling for, is to get rid of the old narrative. What is to be put on is a new self, put off falseness, bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice, and put on tenderheartedness and forgiveness. That's what discipling is all about, is putting off and putting on. Colossians 3, 5 to 14, put to death fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry, until you have stripped off the old self with its practices. And the positive counterpart, clothe yourself with a new self, clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And the grand conclusion in verse 14, above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
what if we quit talking about abortion and homosexuality for a while and started talking about putting off old cells and putting on new cells? What if we started talking about baptism? Change of clothes, change of self, change of story are related to baptism. So we have to be asking, what does it mean to put away the gods of the ancestors? Well, I think the young woman's god of the ancestors was the story of despair. And the business executive's story of the ancestors was the story of docility. And the homeless man's story of the ancestors was the story of deprivation. And they are changing stories and switching worlds. Nobody at Shechem is stuck with their old loyalties or their old gods or their old stories. Everybody can re-choose. Now the rest of this chapter I'll handle more quickly. After he does all that, Joshua warns Israel to be very careful about their deciding. And they vow with great resolve that they will not forsake Yahweh. Verse 17. Verse 18. Therefore, we will serve Yahweh. Yahweh is God. And this is a wonderful church growth text because Joshua says take it easy I don't think you ought to rush in here this is harder than you think I'm warning you do not sign on for this because I don't think you're ready it's not somebody begging people to join the church it's somebody begging people not to be stupid by deciding facilely about the new narrative they say, we will serve Yahweh, verse 18. No, we will serve Yahweh, verse 21. Yes, we are witnesses against ourselves, verse 24. The Lord we will serve, and to him we will listen, verse 24. And Joshua keeps trying to talk them out of it. Because you become an insider at the risk of your life. There was a woman that called the Church of the Savior. And she said, I don't want to join your church. I just want to come to your seminar, and I want to know what it will cost. And the voice on the other end said, our services are free, you just come. She said, no, I want to pay because I'm not going to, I just want to pay. She said, it doesn't cost anything. She said, the third time, I want to pay. And the woman said, it's free, but you ought to know if you come, it'll probably cost you your life. You can't lie to people. <laughs> so, verse 25, Joshua, reluctantly, I think, made a covenant that day at Shechem with statutes and ordinances new obedience. Four things about this new covenant. First, this community is now bound irreversibly and inextricably to the purpose of Yahweh, and Yahweh is now bound inextricably and irreversibly to this people, and Yahweh will never again be people-less, and this community will never again be Yahweh-less. That's a very costly assurance. Second, what's going on here is a covenant. That means a trustful kind of mutuality that will not tolerate autonomy and individualism, which is the dominant heresy of U.S. society. It's not a contract between autonomous partners and freely consenting adults. But it is a decision to become vulnerable and to receive your life from another. Third, this commitment entails a rejection of other gods, other stories, and other gifts, gifts of self-sufficiency and control and self-aggrandizement. Verse 
And fourth, statutes and ordinances means commandments. I believe that the movement of evangelism has great work to do in thinking about how we're going to talk about commandments without it being silly moralism. I think the commandment we probably ought to start with is the Sabbath, which is the great assault on consumerism. So the community at Shechem takes for itself a peculiar vocation in the world. In that ancient world and in this contemporary world, this decision is for a risky existence. All of life is brought under Yahweh's peculiar sovereignty. For the woman, it meant that Yahweh, the God of promise, becomes sovereign in the family. For the business executive, it meant the God of Exodus becomes sovereign over economics. And for the homeless man, the God of Joshua becomes sovereign over the redistribution of social goods. This formation of a new community is marked in our narrative by enactment of a public moment. And in that moment, the community asserts for all to see that this is now a community with a very different intentionality. All three outsiders have now signed on as insiders. I submit that this chapter is a map that is germane to contemporary issues of evangelism, commitment to Canaanite social relationships legitimated by gods of greed and indifference are not remote from us. Thus the meeting conducted by Joshua is set for many re-happenings and replications, and in these re-happenings and replications folk are invited into these alternative memories, alternative promises, and alternative commands. It is never an easy meeting, but the invitation permits an embrace of a very different life, which is known only by insiders. Now, Ben, you want to take some time for us to talk about this? We have some time. If you have question or comment, I want to talk this morning about the second constituency. It is perfectly obvious to all of us that evangelism has to do with the process of helping outsiders become insiders, and that's what I tried to talk about yesterday. I want to talk now about evangelism to insiders, to those whose faith has grown careless and weary and jaded and cynical and routine to propose that insiders are a prime constituency for reincorporation into the vitality of faith. Two texts that I'm going to work on are in Deuteronomy 8 and Jeremiah 3. These ancient voices of Moses and Jeremiah, and I understand that Moses didn't write Deuteronomy. I know Fun Rod wrote it, so that's okay. <laughs> I wanted you to know that I know that. These ancient voices of Moses and Jeremiah understood that in Israel everything depends 
upon the power and the availability of the core memory, a memory that Israel kept close to and relied upon concerning Yahweh, the God of liberation, covenant, and land. Moses and Jeremiah also understood that, well, get this, well-being in the land is an enemy of that core memory. In a context of affluent prosperity, Israel would eventually forget its memory, scuttle the God of the memory, disregard the commands of that God, and forfeit the joy of covenant. And that forgetting jeopardizes Israel's very existence. As a consequence, insiders to the covenant become hollow and uncaring, honoring empty forms of faith and practice, but cut off from the gifts and demands and joys that belong to this relationship. Now, the text that I'm going to talk about in detail is Nehemiah 8. And I want you to know that Mary Ann is going to deal with it later, and Mary Ann and I want you to think that this convergence is planned. It's not, but that's what we want you to think. <laughs> Nehemiah 8 comes at the end of Israel's process of forgetting and seeks to reincorporate these hollow insiders back into the power of faith around three non-negotiable claims. I'll bet you many of you do not know about Nehemiah 8 because what happened in Christian seminaries, you get to second Isaiah, and then you leap to Jehesus. Ben taught me how to say that. <laughs> because all that stuff is Jewish. What's happening now in Old Testament studies is that we're coming to see that that stuff between second Isaiah and the New Testament is primary material for us. Three non-negotiable claims. First, that this community has its life from the Torah scroll. Ezra, Ezra is the guy that made them the people of the book. And it must stay close to the book. It's a big problem to be a texted community. Second, that reincorporation requires a substantive re-engagement with a core memory that is incredibly particularistic. And Ezra requires discipline in re-reading the text in order to recover that memory now forgotten both by the people and their leaders. And third, that the retexting, that's the one word I want you to get out of this hour. The retexting of Israel in the festival of booths is not a cognitive thing done in didactic fashion. But Israel must bodily re experience and reenact the memory. Recovering its vulnerability in bodily exposure, and I want to stress that because Presbyterians are so cerebral. In this extraordinary act in Nehemiah 8, Ezra intends that insiders should be reincorporated into the bite of the faith. And the reason I want to stress this is that I believe there is an analogy to the crisis in Ezra's time and the current U.S. church crisis. The crisis for insiders in our churches, and I do not exempt us, is that abundance and affluence have caused church members to be distanced in self-sufficiency from the power and cruciality of the memory so that the church suffers from a profound amnesia, even among those who vigorously go through the motions. The drama of reincorporation, that's what I'm talking about, suggests for our time and place 
a back-to-the-scroll movement which is not scholastic in its intent, but which entertains a collage of wild images and awesome possibilities that are life-defining. And you know, most of the people that prattle about the authority of Scripture have no notion of the wild images in the Bible. They think it's all in Leviticus 18 and 20. And this drama of reincorporation suggests, secondly, a relearning of the specific detailed substance of the memory that touches every aspect of life. It is simply astonishing about the Old Testament and the New Testament that they give you names and times and places where this stuff happened. And they're not going to get involved in silly 19th century questions about did it really happen. It just says, the Lord said to Abraham, that's it. And thirdly, the drama of reincorporation suggests in our time a bodily act of vulnerability so that the claim of this memory touches our bone marrow in unmistakable ways. I suggest that the primary task of evangelism is evangelizing insiders so that insiders may come to see simply this point, that Ezra wasn't kidding. So the meeting in Nehemiah 8 is not unlike the meeting in Joshua 24, but there are important differences. Unlike Joshua 24, the meeting in Nehemiah 8 is at the end of the Old Testament. Except for the book of Daniel, it's the last datable thing in the Old Testament. When David Noel Friedman thinks you've got to leave Daniel out and say, they meant to close the Bible with that meeting. Unlike Joshua 24, this meeting is not at Shechem on newly explored territory, but the meeting is in the familiar context of beloved Jerusalem at the water gate. Unlike Joshua 24, which comes at the end of great buoyancy about Joshua's triumphant work, this meeting is held at the far edge of exile when they came back to this pitiful, shabby, ruined Jerusalem. Talk about burned out core cities, that's it. Unlike Joshua 24, the key figure in this meeting is not somebody who stood close to Moses, because Ezra wasn't close to anybody. Ezra must bear testimony to memories that are remote from his own experience. And unlike Joshua 24, this meeting does not concern persons who are invited for the first time into Israel's covenantal faith, but it concerns Jews who've been in it forever. The work of the meeting conducted by Ezra is straightforward and simple. They read the scroll. First, the meeting is inclusive, men and women, Verses 2 and 3, all who were old enough to understand. It's very egalitarian. You may recall that in Joshua 24, it says all the leaders and officers. But this is just the folks. Second, that the meeting consists in the reading of the Torah. Now, scholars have endless debates about what they read. They may have read something like the completed Pentateuch that we got, or if you like the documentary hypothesis, there are many scholars who think they read the P tradition. Could be. What is being read is the normative literature. The other thing I want to say about reading the Torah is just too bad that in English, we translate Torah as law. 
that misses the point, because Torah means the entire written and cherished normative memory, all the stuff you got to get from your in-laws when you get married in order to come to the reunion. That's the Torah. <laughs> it is argued in rabbinic tradition that in addition to the written Torah, there is an oral Torah. That means that's the way we talk. You've got to learn how we talk. So think of worship as language practice of learning how to talk right. Well, I'm no Presbyterian, but I tell these Presbyterian seminarians, when you get examined for ordination, they don't care what you believe. They care whether you can talk the way we talk. If you can do that, you'll be all right. This Christian stereotype of Jewish law, on the one hand, is a terrible disservice to Jews, and on the other hand, it cuts Christians off from the dynamic of this Torah enterprise. You can watch little 13-year-old Jewish boys at their bar mitzvah and they ain't nothing coercive or legalistic about it. It is becoming a member of the narrative. So this reading in Nehemiah 8 is a communal appropriation of the core memory that had been forfeited, neglected, trivialized, or scuttled. And in this act of rehearing, the community of women and men was being regathered and reconvened as a community of glad, liberated obedience. Third, the Torah was not only read and proclaimed, it was, verse 8, interpreted parash. This means there was exposition, commentary, translation, appropriation, application so that connections are made between the old tradition and the present circumstance. The old text of Israel's memory never exists as authoritative without imaginative interpretation. Or in answer to Judge Bork, there is no strict constructionism in ancient Israel. It's endlessly open. This people becomes the people of the interpreted book. So that the old text continues to impinge upon imagination with vitality, authority, and contemporaneity. And what happens is that the imagination of the Jewish community almost bought off by the empire, that's the military-industrial complex, is re-scripted around a peculiar textual tradition that is often not known, not valued, and not understood. And the birth of the church happens through the re-scripting of communal imagination. Now, I propose to go behind this meeting in Nehemiah 8 and to consider three texts that I believe run up to it. The first text is in Deuteronomy 8. It is an exquisite piece of Torah theology in the mouth of Moses that says that obedience to Torah is the sine qua non of public well-being. Twice, in verse 1 and verses 5 and 6, Moses appeals in Deuteronomy 8 for obedience. The obedience to which Israel is summoned is situated within and supported by narrative memory. Israel, in verses 3 and 4, is to remember the wilderness as a time of testing, a time of risk and need, and a time of God's faithful care. In that time, Israel becomes aware that it could not store up 
life securities, but it had to depend on the daily gift of bread from heaven. And Israel is to remember that for 40 years of leanness, there was sustenance. Food was given, clothing did not wear out, and your feet did not swell, even though you walked for 40 years. This triad of food, clothes, and feet sounds like Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious what will happen to your feet. The generosity of God is stated in a lyrical statement of extravagant well-being in verses 7 to 10. The Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land flowing with streams, springs, and underwater, underground waters and valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, a land of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you will eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land from whose hills you may mine copper, you may eat your fill and bless the Lord. You know, Golda Meir said that Moses led the people in the wilderness for 40 years and finally brought them to the only place in the Middle East where there's no oil. <laughs> No oil, but wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olives and honey and copper. It's all gift. God is bringing us in. God has given new creation. So in verses 2 and 4, there's an old memory. And in verses 7 and 10, there is a lyrical anticipation between memory and anticipation. And in verse 11, the sermon knows that, get this, prosperity causes amnesia. Verse 11, verse 14, verse 17, do not forget Gratitude has a tough time in the midst of an unlimited affluence. So the statistics of the National Council of Churches show that the richer people are, the less generous they are. You read these tax reports of people like Richard Nixon, sometimes they give $32 a year to charity. The reason is, that one can no longer remember a more precarious time, but all present benefits appear not only to be absolute, it's always it's been this way, but it's also self-generated, making gratitude unnecessary and silly. 30-year-old kinsman of mine who graduated from Davidson College can't understand why these lazy blacks don't get a job. I said, well, maybe it's because nobody forked over $50,000 to go to Davidson. Really do think differently about that. He can't remember that. <laughs> I want to tell you, $40,000 is a lot to get at 25 bucks a Sunday school lesson. That's how I got it. And when you forget, verse 17, you will say, can you imagine anybody in your congregation saying this? My might and my power have gotten me this wealth. Well, then, I didn't make that up. It's written, Moses said it. Then there's no one to thank. And if there's no one to thank, there's no one to heed. And if there's no one to heed, there's no one to obey. And in a twinkling of an eye, one becomes autonomous, self-sufficient, self-admiring, self-congratulatory. You owe yourself this and a boat. <laughs> you know that ancient prayer? I heard a new version of it. Give us the courage to change what cannot be changed and the patience to accept Courage to change what can be changed and the patience to accept what cannot be changed and a red Ferrari. <laughs> and then Moses says, verse 18, if 
you forget, you will surely perish. Now, I do not believe that Moses means this to be kind of supernaturalism, that God will get mad and sweep down from the sky and take you away to hell. I think, rather, Moses understands the political process, the economic process, that if you forget the exodus of liberation and the Sinai of covenant, very soon you will start playing the old power games of Egypt. And very soon you will start practicing brick quotas again in order to get ahead in the Babylonian Empire. And when you make enough out of brick quotas again, what will happen is that the option of freedom and egalitarian covenant will simply be given up to perish means that this vision of social reality will disappear not by divine assault, but by seduction and erosion, and Israel will have been talked out of its peculiar vision of reality and its daring practice of neighborliness and won't even notice that it's been talked out of it. To perish is to give up one's theological identity and to trade the birthmark, the birthright for a mess of pottage. So Israel lays, Moses lays down the options and the dangers that will vex Israel when it goes into the land of prosperity and everything depends upon remembering. And everything is jeopardized by forgetting. Everything rides upon remembering or forgetting. And I want to say to you, the practice of ordained ministry has to do with being the rememberer of the miracles. Jeremiah 2, in verses 2 and 3, God is like a wounded lover. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness. I remember when we were first in love and you just couldn't get enough of me. You just followed me around everywhere. You wanted to be with me. But in verse 5, there is an abrupt jolt in the poetry and God says, what went wrong? The good old days are ended Everything has gone sour, and now instead of going after me, you go far from me. You've traded me for something that is cheap and quick and trivial. And then in verses Jeremiah 2, verses 6 and 8, something of an indictment. Israel did not say. Did not say what needed to be said, did not recite the core memory, did not say, where is Yahweh who brought us up from the land of Egypt and brought us into the wilderness, in the land of deserts and pits, in the land of drought and deep darkness, in the land where no one passes through. I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you entered but when you entered, you defiled my land and you made my heritage an abomination. Yahweh is the subject of all of those sentences that Israel does not say. You heard, didn't you, that it's dominated by the word land, the land of Egypt, the land of wilderness, the land of deserts, the land of drought, the land with no inhabitants, and the land is a gift of Yahweh. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of flowing streams and underground waters and valleys and hills and wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olives and honey and copper. Yahweh kept the promise and then this harsh adversative, you defiled my land. You polluted it. You made it unlivable 
because you forgot everything you needed to remember. And then in verse 8, he takes on the leadership. The priests, the handlers of the Torah, that's the lawyers, kings, the prophets, they did not say, where is Yahweh? They scuttled the memory, just like Moses said they would. And when they forgot, they forgot their past, they forgot Yahweh, they forgot themselves, they forgot their history, they forgot their identity, they forgot their faith, they forgot their vocation, they forgot their raison d'etre. They created a fabric of lies and dishonesty and denial. And they ended up lying to each other and saying, peace, 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 when there is no peace. I believe the economy is bottomed out. I believe capitalism is one. I believe there are no homeless people. I believe everything. Okay, well, if you can't, I'll try to do better, but if you miss any of them, look in Jeremiah 2. <laughs> thank, thank you. That, oh, I go, okay, all right. Well, those of you who want that should sit up closer, and the ones that want to read the scroll should sit back there. <laughs> and this text ends in Jeremiah, in verse 13, by saying, Two evils, they've forsaken living water, and they've dug out cracked cisterns. So first, there was a time of real love and devotion. Second, there has been a long season of forgetting. And third, the wells have run dry. That's very close to what's going on with folks in our society. That's the tap root of brutality and self-indulgence and the abuse of women and children and da 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 because the wells have run dry. Third text, Isaiah 51. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug, look to Abraham your father and Sarah who bore you. This is addressed to exiles. Engage in remembering. What they need to do in exile, and in the recent issue of the Journal for Preachers, I have made an argument that exile is a primal metaphor for the practice of ministry in the United States. And if you don't like that article, you ought to subscribe to the journal anyway. What exiles need to do is to recover their memory all the way back to the book of Genesis, all the way back to Father Abraham and Mother Sarah. Doesn't mention here Moses and Torah. Remember Abraham, this old man without hope, who dared to argue with God, who mocked God's promises, who trusted God, who risked his own son in full obedience. Remember Sarah who laughed in mocking and then laughed in boisterous Easter laugh because God had done what God said God would do. Remember and then shake loose of the destructive definitions of reality that are all around us, that are false, that are killing us. Isaiah 51 is addressed to exiles who are in the throes of the imperial ideology of Babylon. That ideology had canceled promise by propaganda, had dismissed promise by present satiation, had denied providence by the ruthless claims of imperial power and remembering is the hard choosing of an alternative present tense that is authorized by a subversive 
past. And when that subversive past is given up, an alternative present is simply unavailable. So the choice, this poet says, is clear. Choose memory and you will be liberated. Choose amnesia and what you get is despair and status quo and a stunted kind of imagination that can't get beyond what you can see. And then you're dead. So Deuteronomy 8 is a warning that prosperity causes amnesia. Jeremiah 2 is a condemnation that the memory has been abandoned and Isaiah 51 is an invitation to re-enter the memory. So now Nehemiah 8 one more time. This meeting in Nehemiah 8 in the 5th century as late is a re-founding of Judaism after a long, terrible season of amnesia. It is as though Jews are coming out of a coma. And upon recovery, these Jews ask, where am I? Who am I? How did this happen to us? And the answers are all in the Torah as they face their quintessential oddness. Now when the Torah was read, it says, verse 9, the people wept. Yeah, that happened, don't you? You don't know why it happens. You've kept stuff bottled for so long you don't know you're bottling and somebody says some delicate thing that touches your childhood and you dissolve in a flood of tears having been waiting for the right opportunity to let it all grief out. Maybe it was the grief of repentance that touched their guilt But I think more likely it was the deep, visceral release of vulnerability. <laughs> I'd been so afraid that somebody would find me out, and I am so glad it has finally happened. I am so tired of faking it. The weeping comes when we touch our core identity and we no longer have to front for the contradiction because faking it is exhausting and the floodgates of hurt and passion and grief and gratitude and open disclosure of the self and the community of selves that did not seem possible no longer embarrassed by that fundamental honesty about who we really are. Now you ask yourself in the town where you live, how many places are there where people can gauge about fundamental honesty of who they really are in this core memory? Have you had the experience of being somewhere in a foreign country and you only half guess at what's being said and then in the train station you hear somebody talking American and you rush over and hug them? <laughs> there are a lot of people who are baptized who are waiting to hear the Muttersprach, the mother tongue of rescue and miracle and hope. Now the leadership sees these people weeping and says, 
This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. They'd have never gotten through a CPE by saying that. I thought you'd like to know I know about those things. <laughs> For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Torah, and he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And it does happen that deep weeping with the right touch becomes extravagant joy. It's life at the extremities after you've learned to live in the safe middle ground, which is as boring as hell. Because the ground and power of joy is the same as the ground and power of weeping. They are the two elemental experiences that belong to our humanness. And the reason for the utter joy is that they had understood the words that had been declared to them. They understood as they had not in their long season of amnesia what it meant to belong to Yahweh, the worker of miracles and the actor of freedom and the giver of commandments. And their joy is a theological, evangelical homecoming. They were coming down where they ought to be. And as they studied the Torah, they found as a primal point of teaching, verses 13 to 18, the festival of booths. This great sacramental act was a physical, bodily, visible re-engagement with their past. And they were commanded that they should publish and proclaim in all their towns and in Jerusalem, go out to the hills and bring branches of olive and wild olive and myrtle and palm and other leafy branches to make booths, as it is written. And they did it, verse 16. For seven days they made and lived in booths. They experienced the fragility, the precariousness, and the vulnerability of their Jewishness. They lived midst the presence of old mothers and fathers who had departed Egypt long ago for the wilderness. They communed with their parents who had lived exposed in the wilderness and found Yahweh to be adequate. They disengaged from the old demanding supports of the Egyptian empire and they disengaged from the demanding supports of the Babylonian and Persian empires. They submitted themselves to the costs and risks and joys that belonged to this memory and they could sense in their bodies distance from that very affluence that had talked them out of their identity. There's something very odd about the Festival of Booths. On the one hand, it is the experience of exposed homelessness. Some of you may know that the open door here in Atlanta in its witness for the homeless, calls the Festival of Booze a festival of homelessness and invites fully housed people to go live in the park one night, which is an act of leaving our conventional securities. On the other hand, and at the same time, the Festival of Booze is an experience of true homefulness. This is where I belong. This is who my people are. This is the right, safe place lived with the sojourning God who keeps people safe in dangerous exposure. And homelessness turns out to be homefulness. And there was great rejoicing. in the disciplines of fasting and sackcloth. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it says they separated themselves from all the foreigners. 
Now I understand our old-fashioned Christian reading of that is that these Jews are really arrogant legalists and they separated themselves from all the wrong people. But that's to miss the point. This community of amnesia had assimilated itself and domesticated its memory and compromised its identity so that it had nothing left. Sound like the church? Judaism had become such a detrimental embarrassment that little boys and girls wanted to pretend they weren't Jews. And now in these liturgical acts, Jews are facing up to their oddity and their commitment and their obedience. And I say this to you because I believe the church in the United States faces a crisis of accommodation and compromise that is near to final evaporation. The distinctiveness is not in doctrine, and it's not in morality. They don't argue about that stuff, but it's in memory. And then in chapter 9, there follows a long prayer, the reading of Torah, and the entering of the booths drives Judah to prayer. It's a marvelous prayer. I make three comments. The first is that the prayer is a recital of all of Jewish history. We only do this occasionally in the Eucharistic prayer when we talk about prophets and apostles and saints and martyrs. Our amnesia-ridden boys and girls need to know about the recital of all the folks Second, that the prayer is an acknowledgement that this long history is a long history of recalcitrance and disobedience. But third, the prayer is not an act of groveling because the tone of the prayer is doxological, knowing that the generosity of God overrides the failure of Israel. So Jewish oddity finally comes down to God's mercy. And the liturgy culminates in 938 by saying, the new RSV says, they made a firm agreement. They made a new covenant because they have decided they are not going to be citizens of the empire. I think we need to ponder a long time the correlation between forgetting and accommodating and remembering as the source of missional courage, energy, and freedom. And this oath that they take in chapter 9 leads to the practice of Sabbath in chapter 10 and, now I'm finally going to say something practical, to the practice of tithing in 10, 32 to 39. And in chapter 9, verse 10, it says, they shared with those for whom nothing has been prepared. So my theme is a simple one. Forgetters can become rememberers. I believe that the reality of amnesia is massive among us. We do not describe it as amnesia. We talk about biblical illiteracy. But what it means is that we don't have the ma materials available out of which we can imagine our life differently. And I think... To recover that memory will require pastors to commit overt acts of epistemological scandal. Say, folks, I'm going to tell you something this morning that you think is utterly absurd and irrational. We do it on Easter, you know. We get by with it.
Most of us have not thought systematically about the Enlightenment. Most of us just went to college and learned all this stuff, and only now are we being retaught that the Enlightenment, that's the church gave its colleges away to the Enlightenment, that the Enlightenment was designed to scuttle memory. But even in our amnesia, most of us can recall a pivot point of memory. Conservative people, more often than not, can name the time and place when they were saved. And liberals uh, mumbled. <laughs> my pivot point in my evangelical tradition was not intense or pious. But I remember that lyrical, doxological, wondrous last answer that I recited from the Evangelical Catechism on my Confirmation Day. I don't know how any adult had the nerve to expect any child to say it. Lord Jesus, for thee I live, for thee I suffer, for thee I die. Lord Jesus, thine will I be in life and death. Grant me, O Lord, eternal salvation. And then we were ushered into the sacristy of the church, and Mr. Gruby had assigned the book. And it felt like we were signing the book of life. And then we all have this long season of amnesia. And I propose that we must undertake the work of Ezra, who is a model of evangelism as remembering. Nehemiah 8 is a moment of liminality in this community when old patterns have failed, when people in their grief and joy could leave their conventional home and live in booths of fragility. And I believe our work, get this, our work is to re-booth people. Ezra did not worry about the Persians. His first thought was to recover this community of Jews whose clothes did not wear out and whose feet did not swell. And his prayer ends in 936-37 this way. Here we are, slaves to this day, slaves in the land that you gave to our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sin. They have power also over our bodies and over our livestock, and we are in great distress. And we are relearning what it means to have our names inscribed in such a firm agreement.
Now, I have uh, talked about two constituencies of outsiders becoming insiders and of insiders who are forgetters becoming rememberers. I want to talk about a third constituency for evangelism, and that is the children of believers. Uh, I think it will be clear to you very quickly that I do not in this lecture have things together very well. I thought I had the other two together pretty well. Uh, partly uh, that's because the nurture of children into faith doesn't happen in a meeting. If it did, we'd hold that meeting. But it happens by this torturous process of conversation. And the most important thing is to keep the conversation going. That's one reason I don't have it together. And the other reason I don't have it together is that I am a parent. <laughs> and the problem with nurturing children into faith, and I know nothing about developmental stages and all of that sort of business, so I just plunge ahead with the text, is this terrible dialectic of freedom and dependence that all of us work at, but particularly children. And if you keep the children too dependent, I think you run the risk that so-called evangelicals often do, that faith becomes coercive and authoritarian. But if you are only receptive all the time, you run the risk of being a therapeutic liberal that just kind of says yes in a bland way to wherever the child is going. So I think it is the problem of being an advocate for the gospel and being receptive to the inscrutable mystery of growth that none of us understands. It is a truism among us, is it not, that kids today have a harder time growing up in faith or growing up than any time in our cultural memory. I wouldn't want to be 6 or 16 or 22. It's just damn hard. But we need to recognize that the reason it's damn hard is precisely because of the breakup of the Constantinian hegemony. Will Willimon tells the story that when he was a kid in Greenville, for God's sake, my son, this is digression, my son drives to Montreat often on back roads and he always stops in to have a Coke in a filling station where there's some good old boys. And he went in one day and uh, they were talking about how dangerous the city was and if you go into the city, your hubcaps will get stolen and your women will get raped and it's just all violent. He was talking about Greenville. <laughs> but Will Willimon said when he grew up, you knew that everybody in the community was trying to help you be a Christian. And now that isn't true. That's not even true in Greenville. So what we have to take care is that we don't nurture Constantinian Christians among our sons and daughters, lest they become kind of irrelevant when they arrive at adult faith. So I really have been thinking about whether faith is possible for our kids. And so it tends to fall out in two directions, either of a kind of a seductive secularism, 
that's just kind of bland and tolerant, kind of good Americanism. And you see a lot of those kids in Montreal, they're just wearing their $200 shoes and walking around. And then kids who grow up in families like that go away to college and meet some so-called evangelical and they leap into sectarianism. And so I think what we have to think about in the evangelism of our own young is whether faith is possible that is not simply bland liberalism or moralistic sectarianism. Now, the way I've set this up this morning is that there are three threes, three threes in my organization, so I'm going to say three things with three sub points, so you should finish with nine, and if we get nine at the same time, I'll stop. <laughs> the first three is to talk about needs of children, and what I'm going to say this morning is all perfectly obvious to you, that are determined not only by children, but determined by the truth of the gospel. You know, Karl Barth said, the gospel doesn't just give you the answers, it gives you the right questions. And my argument simply is that there are models in the Bible and what we need to do with our young is to play the whole Bible that has many different strategies. So first, children need unconditional advocacy. They need, and you know people have written on this now, a child needs someone who is literally crazy for that boy or girl. And that ain't easy in a society of competence and productivity. And many boys and girls figure out that my mom and dad are crazy with me as long as I can get a bumper sticker that says, my child is an honor student or something. So we got to nurture evangelical baptized children away from merit, competence, and productivity. That's not easy for Constantinian Presbyterians. The text I'd give you is from Psalm 103. Like as a father pities his children, and the word pity is racham, which means womb-like mother love. And then you know the text goes on to say, he remembers our frame. That's the old translation. And the word frame is the same word as the verb form in Genesis 2. This pitying mother-like father remembers the fragility of our life. Not a bad thing for adults because every one of us aches to have somebody remember our fragility. Second need is that kids need, and the older they get, the more they need, a coherent construct of reality that lets all the parts make sense as a whole. And very much so-called evangelical rhetoric doesn't do that. I think it means that the sons and daughters need to see the fathers and mothers endlessly engaged in interpretive conversation about how the parts yield to the whole, and the whole informs the parts. We have in Constantinianism assumed that what we need to give our sons and daughters were our conclusions, 
yeah, we will do the, enough of that. But I think kids not need so much conclusions as to see our courage and our freedom and our joy in the interpretive process, and by and large, my impression is that adult Christians do not know how to do that very well, because if you do that, you are conceding that you don't have everything wrapped up in a package. So it is not enough for a son or a daughter to know that God loves you unless that God is also known to be the maker of heaven and earth who, as Hannah says, makes rich and makes poor. That means from early on, little kids got to understand that this God has to do with socioeconomic political questions. And a suburban church can't wait too long to see that if faith is an adequacy for life, it must deal with the inequities that little boys and girls notice very early. Now third, this kind of nurture and evangelism is counter nurture. That means that the task of the church is not to produce good Americans or moral boys and girls or productive boys and girls, but the task of the church is to produce odd boys and girls. Odd as baptism. So I think that the language of Sesame Street is exactly right. Which one of these is not like the others? And the answer is us. So I think you can see the biblical text itself working with the boys and girls in ancient Israel to talk about unconditional advocacy, coherent construal, and counter-nurture. And those things must be reenacted and reappropriated in every new generation. And I think mainline establishment churches have sort of quit on those processes. And what we are in process of is finding our way back in to doing those things. So that's the first set of three. Second. I want to talk about the drama of incorporation. That is the processes in the Bible whereby the adult community hands this stuff over in some receivable way. Uh, by which I do not mean a cognitive package, but what I, by which I mean a trajectory of imagination, because what we really want are for sons and daughters to imagine the world the way we imagine the world. First of these, this is probably obvious to you, there are six texts that talk about parents testifying to children, testimony about sacramental mysteries. That is, by sacramental mysteries, I mean funny things you do in church. Which show the adults giving unembarrassed testimony that they want their sons and daughters to take as credible. The texts are... And I, I, in the first uh, chapter of my book, uh, The Creative Word, I have uh, given you this. Uh, Exodus 12, 26, Exodus 13, 8, Exodus 13, 14, Exodus, I'm mean, sorry, Deuteronomy 6, 20, Joshua 4, 6, and Joshua 4, 21. 
The first three of these in Exodus 12 and 13 have to do with the celebration of the Passover in which the boys and girls see these funny things like unleavened bread and the blood on the doorpost. In Deuteronomy 6, it has to do with uh, commandments, and in Joshua 4, it has to do with uh, getting the stones placed right in the Jordan so you can walk across. The purpose of these dramatic acts is to evoke an intergenerational conversation. That is, you want to do something peculiar that will cause the kids to say, why are we doing this? You know, why do we have to go to church? And what's clear is that the adults know that in these sacramental mysteries, there are hidden meanings which to a neutral observer appear to be irrational. You can check this out sometimes. Stand at the back of a church and watch a congregation celebrate the Eucharist. You talk about something goofy <laughs> if you are not inside the sacramental mystery. So the boys and girls say in these six, what is this service to you? What is this? What is the decree, statute, and ordinance that Yahweh has commanded you? What are these stones to you? What are these stones? The boys and girls have their curiosity aroused by this peculiar liturgy. Did you notice some of these questions are posed as though they were objective questions? What is this? And some of them are personal existential questions whereby the child says, what is this to you? What makes mom and dad tick? And the adult answers, see the educational process turned around. Confirmation is all about adults asking questions and children memorizing the answers. The children ask the questions, the adults have to give the answers. Pretty embarrassing. Well, the answer is this, my child. Yahweh struck down the Egyptians but spared our houses. This is what Yahweh did when I, I'm quoting, when I came out of Egypt. By the strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. The Lord God dried up the waters. That's why we're doing these funny things. Every case, every case, the adult answer witnesses to a miracle that invokes a powerful active verb in which Yahweh is the subject of the verb. It's a funny way to talk. See, so much, the question back there the first day was, do evangelicals spend too much time being coercive? Well, yeah. And liberals certainly do want to talk about miracles just because they do busy reading National, National Geographic, something liberals read. But notice that the testimony of miracles is counter-nurture because it says to our sons and daughters, the world is not the way Constantine says it is. The world is freighted with possibility and power and potential that are given by the mercy of God. And it's not some exotic spirituality, but it is simply the truth of our day-to-day -day existence. There's kind of a buoyancy in these answers. In Deuteronomy 6, the son says, what is the meaning of the commandments which Yahweh has commanded you, Dad, you? And the parent answers, we 
<laughs> we were slaves. Michael Fishbane has an interesting analysis of this in which he says that what the child's question wants to do is to distance himself from the parental faith. What does that mean to you? And the parent refuses the distance and says, us. And Fishbane has a wonderful word. He says the parent insists that we are all contemporaries in this miracle, and the children present themselves as distemporaries. Interesting word, and it ain't, it ain't nothing of mine. So the strategy of the parent is important. The parent does not insist or coerce or assume too much, but simply gives an inclusive witness and ignores the son's, this is all masculine language, but you can easily transpose that, ignores the son's distancing and assumes that the son is the part of the us. Now we may wonder at the age when the child would ask this question, it's easiest to imagine that a small child asks these questions in innocence. But I have no doubt that if there is a non-threatening, trusting context, children of every age right through the teen years want to know whether the miracles that are at the core of their parents' life really can be counted on. No explanations, no arguments, simply testimony. The second strategy for incorporation I call narratives of saturation. The text that you know very well that I want to focus on is in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, in which Moses, or fictive Moses, or Funrod, or whoever, says you shall write it on your hand, and on your forehead, and on your doorpost. Just put a lot of slogans up. Ancient cathedrals are filled with visual educational devices that we call art. But the visible signs in this text are subordinated to the rhetoric. Israel is always talking, not looking. Shema. And the verb is recite which means to repeat and reiterate again and again. So as you know, the text says, and you shall talk about this stuff when you go in and when you come out and when you sit down and when you rise up. Everywhere, always. And you might want to say, well, you know, you can't really do that. We have to be inventive about how you do it, but we do do that with the things that are most important to the family. We just keep talking about them. Because we are shaping the imagination in elemental ways, and you know many, many old people who had strokes, and they can't remember anything from the last 50 years, they can hardly talk but they can remember those old Bible passages that they memorized when they were seven years old because the ruts are cut deep in the brain. Or in Judges 5, it says, this is the song of Deborah, when you ride, when you sit, when you travel, repeat the saving acts of Yahweh, talk about the transformations. And what I find wonderful about Judges 5.10 is that it is about the women gathering at the village watering hole. Deborah says, sisters, let's gossip. You know, etymologically, the word gossip is linked to the word gospel. It's stuff that has to 
talked about everywhere, all the time. Have you heard that? And all this gossip, all these secrets, <laughs> has only one subject, Yahweh, the one to love and trust and fear and honor and hope for and count on. So reiterate, but reiteration is not simply the repeating of slogans, but reiteration, I take it in Deuteronomy, means being a live hermeneutist, a live interpreter that can turn with and play and host and toss up and reconfigure. And adults in the church do not know much how to do that. Third strategy for incorporation, because the first two can become too didactic. third strategy I want to suggest is in the ancestral stories of the book of Genesis, which concern not the commandments, not liberation, but concern the delicate, inscrutable flow of the blessing of God in the world. There is a contrast between blessing and salvation. And it is now clear in Old Testament scholarship that scholarship and evangelicals have been too preoccupied with salvation to the neglect of blessing. Salvation is kind of the deliverance miracles, but blessing is the inscrutable working of the generative processes of creation that we don't quite understand and we can't quite see and we certainly don't administer. In Genesis 12 to 50 are kind of studied reflections on how it is that you can say to the next generation that the force is with, is with you. That is, you can tell it's very different to say the force is with you than to say Christ died for my sins. It's a very different mode of incorporation. But what these stories want to say to the boys and the girls is that there's something very funny going on in our family. And if you watch all of those stories, those stories in Genesis are almost all at the hinge point between the generations. The question of evangelism that we're talking about is how do you get this stuff safely into the next generation? It's an endless study in Montreat to watch those houses being turned over to the next generation. And you want to turn them over because they're too expensive to maintain, but if you turn them over too quickly, you may discover that they won't let you come up there in the summertime anymore. And besides that, if you've got five kids, you can't turn a house over to five owners in the next generation. Will, Will Kennedy has a house like that, and it's rotten down, he told me, because the five brothers and sisters can't agree on how to spend money to repair it. It's a terrible thing to get this stuff into the next generation. <laughs> and everybody who's got money worries about that. You know, what if it falls into the hands of an in-law? I'm one of those in Montreal. So you know how the story goes. Sarah 
is barren and Abraham is old. And what you get is Hagar. And then you get Ishmael, except Isaac is the real guy. And as soon as Isaac is born in chapter 21, in chapter 22, God says, I'll take him now. And it is not until after Mother Sarah is dead in 23, and Rebekah, his wife, is located in 24, and Father Abraham is dead in 25, only in chapter 26 does Isaac get the promise. The narrator put it off a long time. And there are families in which the child of promise doesn't accept the promise till he's 57 years old. And the parents are long dead before, oh, that's what they were talking about. And Isaac now knows in chapter 26 that he's the guy. But in chapter 27, the crisis of the blessing starts over again because that's Jacob and Esau. He said, well, it, it feels like Esau. <laughs> but it sounds like Jacob, and it feels like Jacob's conniving mother. <laughs> and you see, Jesus had read this story in 27 before he told about the two sons in Luke 15. Because Esau comes and says, Dad, I want the force now. He says, well, I gave it to you. No, you didn't give it to me. And Isaac said, well, I guess it's gone. And then he says, oh, bless me too. Isaac weeps because it's already been taken. Families are like that. Every family has a favorite son or daughter. And the sons and daughters who are not the favorites notice it. And they position themselves before the funeral. And this family is astonished that it turns out that this unprincipled Jacob is the guy. And nobody intended that in heaven or on earth. And in chapter 28 at Bethel, God makes this incredible promise to Jacob, I won't give you everything. And Jacob says, okay. And I'll take it from you. I'll take it from you if Jacob sets conditions for God. What a guy. <laughs> That's in chapter 28 and in chapter 29. Rebecca, what do you guess? <laughs> She's barren. They got all these 11 other sons. But Rebecca's son is supposed to get the promise. I'm sorry, Rachel's, Rachel's son is supposed to get the promise. And finally, only belatedly, comes little Joseph. And you know how people are. They have all these kids, and they kick him in the butt, and then the caboose comes along 18 years later, and they just kind of, oh, wow. And he doesn't work. He just sits around and daydreams. And he mentions to his brothers that he really got nice clothes. I think daddy loves me a lot. <laughs> and then when Father Jacob is an old man in 48, Joseph knows that we're about to transmit again. So he brings Ephraim and Manasseh and say, Daddy, 
give them to these boys, but Jacob never quits. He goes like this, and he messes it up again. He says, oh, did I mess it up? Well, it happens. Now, that's a story for us to look at, but it's also a story that looks at us that says we live in a world where God's generative power is at work in ways that Constantine didn't understand, but getting in touch with it is hard, endless work. And very many of you have parishioners who do not understand and couldn't name the fact that the great work of their life is to see how this blessing can be sustained into the next generation. So you can be more heavy-handed like Exodus, or you can be an endless talker like Deuteronomy, or you can back off like Genesis. And then the question becomes, is this family really a carrier of a blessing that will turn the curse of the earth? That's a second set of three. But my impression about parenting is that we're not usually worried about such grand questions. We're really uh, worried about uh, getting our kids into a moral tradition. On the day that my wife and I had been married nine months, I sent my mother a note and said, it's going to be all right. Nobody's pregnant yet. <laughs> Because my mother just always said, be good. And we all knew what that meant. And that don't get anybody pregnant. So evangelism wants to induct our sons and daughters into an ethical tradition. And I want to identify three dimensions of the moral shaping of reality, two of which I think we neglect a lot in the use of the Bible. The first one probably hangs on a thin thread textually. That's all right, since I got the microphone. <laughs> in Psalm 7325, which is the greatest of all the Psalms, I do believe, at the end of the psalm, the speaker ends in great warm faith and says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And whom do I desire on earth but you? Now what I want to suggest as you think about moral shape is that the Bible knows, and I, want to, I would work with the Psalms on this, that we are fundamentally desiring creatures. We are intended to lust after God. Our hearts are restless until they rest with you as the heart pants after the water brook. <laughs> so I pant after you. There's something erotic about evangelical faith. You know, you can, uh, electronic church is tapped into that sort of. So I thought about the phrase first communion. It's kind of a Catholic deal. And now we're talking about whether we're going to let little children commune. I have no pronounced feeling about that, except that the moral shaping of reality arises 
out of a sense of communion, out of a sense of being with in such affirmative, lovely, beautiful, caressing ways. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, because I don't want to be anywhere else. That's why black church services can last three hours. Who wants to go anywhere else? Because if a black person leaves the church, he's just going to go out into Whitey's world and get beat up on. I think we've got to tell our kids, the, the, the kids got to see us thinking and practicing. The time for being in the presence is urgent among us. Because it is in communion that I learn that I am an end and not a means. And we now know psychologically that little boys and girls who have always been a means and never an end grew up to be sociopaths and who think all neighbors are therefore means and not ends. But this business of desire makes us nervous. And so one way we handle it is to displace the desire for God, which the Catholics have remembered. We would rather have a desire for the world's greeds and ambitions for consumer stuff. It's all right to desire another pair of running shoes but it's bad religion to desire God. So we live in a society that has displaced our proper desire for God. And then the reaction to that secondly is we repress all desire. And people with repressed desires become dangerous moralists. So I think we got to undo that process with our children. To help our children know in underneath ways that God is indeed a partner in communion. And that means that the boys and girls need to know all the stories that give the density of the character of God in the Bible who does not fit the creeds. And the great narratives of God are made up of little particular narratives. So the theologians talk about Genesis 3 and the story of the fall. But if you look at the text, it's not a story about a fall. It's what he said and she said and the snake said and God said. And to live in this communion with this character, you have to be able to remember precisely what all these people said. So one of the tasks of communion is to get down from the generalizations into the specificity, which is what you do in therapy. You don't go to therapy and talk about, well, I think. What you really have to do is to get back when you were seven years old and you can remember how it felt when she said and he said and you said. So it is the incredible particularity of the family story, which means that the God with whom we commune lives on the, get this, lives on the lips of storytellers and nowhere else. And if the specificity of the story about this character of density is not told, communion will be thin.
And when communion is thin, Christians will tear each other's eyes out over so-called moral questions. Family stories are narratives of particularity aimed at communion. I do not think that moral issues are unimportant, but I think when they are embedded in communion, they will be handled differently. Second dimension of the moral shaping of reality, and this one is more obvious to you, are the commandments. I want to say two things about the commandments. First of all, that the commandments must be embedded in playful narrative. And I believe that the knowledge of the will of God arises out of God, how God has shown God's self to be in the narratives. David Noel Friedman recently has published a book, I don't think it's very convincing, in which he says the first nine books of the Bible are correlated with the first nine commandments. I don't think he can do that. Second, as we grow older, we, if we reflect, we discover that our parents stood for something. You pastors hear that when you gather the grown siblings together to get ready for the funeral of the old lady. Well, tell me about your mother. Well, my mother always thought or said but mother did not stand on a mountain and give clay tablets. But it emerges over time that we learn what our parents most cared about. I want to suggest to you that the commandments are the agenda of what God most cares about. God most cares about God's own holiness and the justice of the neighbors. God most cares that neighbors and their lives and their bodies and their property should be treated as ends and not as means. And what God most cares about is a summons away from self-indulgence and a summons away from destructive self-denial. Because there ain't anything about self-denial. You shall love your neighbor as though it were yourself. And what happens is that as we grow older, the depth and sophistication and scope of what our parents most cared about becomes much larger and comprehensive. I think that's how to think about the commandments as we nurture our children into moral shapings. So what God most cared about is that thou shalt not covet. Now, in a child, that means don't beat up on your brother or sister. But as you reflect about what God most cared about, if you have a little imagination, it relates to the Brazilian rainforests, doesn't it? You shall not covet. Our young need to know that the commands of God are generative of imaginative obedience. 
And I think that the church loses a lot of kids in high school and college because it has not been made clear that the ethical tradition of commands is an endless imaginative reflection on what God most cares about. Third strategy for moral shaping is the wisdom tradition of the book of Proverbs. Not much used by evangelicals except here and there to find a coercive slogan. But what the book of Proverbs is about is an intergenerational conversation which on the one hand wants to say, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We know some stuff. And learning is a fiduciary relationship. But on the other hand, the wisdom tradition lets the older people say, now, my son, my daughter, what have you experienced that we can incorporate into this? It's not heavy-handed. It's not terribly didactic. It's certainly not coercive. But the wisdom teachers believe that the world is a coherence in which everything is related to everything else. And what we have to keep probing is how are things related to each other? My favorite example is in Proverbs 15, I think it is where the teacher says better is a dinner of herbs with love than a dinner of fatted ox with strife. Better greens with love than roast beef with quarreling. So which would you like? What I'd like is roast beef with love, not an option. Now why is it? What's he talking about? Well, I think it goes like this, that fatted ox, roast beef, is code word for a very high standard of living. You know, most people in the world do not eat meat more than twice a month, except us. And you know what it takes to put roast beef on the table every night? It takes two working parents. And both working parents arrive home tired because you got to get all this meat on the table and um, you just barely get it on the table and everybody sits down and everybody's too tired to talk to each other and pretty soon there's a quarrel and some kid stomps off to her bedroom and slams the door and the rest of the family sits at the table in a stupor and has no appetite for roast beef. What the proverb is about is an eating disorder. And we now know that individuals do not have anorexia. Families have eating disorders. If that's right, it means that this proverb is a countercultural observation that what you're really hungry for is not meat. What you're really hungry for can be satisfied with greens if there's serious engagement at the table. So the teachers are saying to the kids, oh, why don't you think about what you want to eat? And why don't you think about what it's going to cost you? And is that really what you want anyway? No, thou shalt not hear. It's just saying there's only a given number of choices, and the wisdom teachers go on to talk about sexuality and words and work and money, and they rarely talk about sin. What they talk about is foolishness. Do not buy in on the stupidity of the world. Because those who know that the world is the fabric of God's creation know something different.
a footnote to wisdom is that it's not only Proverbs, but it's Job. And our kids ought to know before they go off to college and discover Camus that our family has known about raging against God before Camus ever appeared. And what our family has known is you can take it right to the throne of God and dump the shit in God's lap. And in response, God will not pass a CPE because here's all this pain on the table and God says, let me tell you about my crocodile. The, ne and the, the supervisor says, you changed the subject, you flinched at the pain. We know that. We got these texts. It's all right to rage in the presence of God. I want to suggest to you that all of these strategies for moral shape of desire, command, and wisdom treat boys and girls as though they were full partners in the interpretive conversation. Now I understand somebody's going to think that that's relativism. But you know the certitudes that we most trust are the certitudes that arise on a day-to-day -day basis out of trusting conversations. And the next time we have a serious conversation, that certitude is going to be nuanced differently. Conclusion, a simple one. Evangelism in a post-Constantinian world is much harder work in a Constantinian settlement. The good news is that it's not nearly as boring. <laughs> now, we got a little time.